everybody. This is Alan Feldman from the Laguna Woods Democratic Club. And this is another segment of our program, Black in Laguna Woods. I want to thank you for taking your time to watch us today. Now, if you've watched this program before, uh, you know that our usual course of events is that we have two, sometimes three people speaking about experiences, their experiences, their feelings about being African-American, being a person of color here in Laguna Woods, the South Orange County area. But we're doing something different today. We only have one person we're speaking with today, and that's going to be Willie Phillips. Now, I know some of you might know Willie Phillips because he's been on the show a couple of times. In fact, he was on the show in September. And in September, we were discussing the lynching of Emmett Till, in addition to the, the reactions and the actions of his mother, Mamie Till. And just in passing, kind of in passing, uh, Willie Phillips stated that he had had a very similar experience with a member of his family when he was eight years, I think eight years old. And that's basically what we want to talk about today. Uh, and, the, you know, it's what happened to some degree. We don't need to get into the gory details. You know, but we saw something that nobody should be forced to see. So you don't need to relive it. But, you know, how did it make him feel? What actions did he did he take? You know, but the really interesting thing to me uh, when it comes to, when it comes to this is the person Willie Phillips is today and this journey he went on from seeing what he saw to what he is today. How did he get there? That's really what I want to ask him about. So Willie Phillips, thank you so much for being here today and talking about this. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, and I want to get started just so people know just a little background about, uh, about you. Uh, you know, where we were born and raised and, uh, uh, you know, the, I guess the circumstances of your family, you know, economically, socially, just, you know, what kind of background did you come from at this time? Okay, well, thank you, Alan, and, and thank you for having me today. Um, I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana in 1950, and I was raised in an area called the Cooper Road, which was a totally uh, Black community of about 26,000 people. And there were four uh, corner stores or community stores in the neighborhood, and they were all on and ran by white people. I was very curious about that early on. And as far as my my background, um, you know, I, I just was very a very curious kid. The fairs would come to town every October for two to three weeks, and when we were kids, five six years old, my aunts and and my mother would get together and take us all to the fair, but we only, the black, the black kids only had one day to go to the fair. And that was the last day of the fair that was called dog, dog day. And so we got to go on dog day when 30, 40, 50% of the rides were taken down. And I would begin to ask questions about stuff like that. And oh boy, don't be bothering me with that. Let's just go and enjoy. I had a, 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 an uncle, uh, my mother's brother, Lee Arthur Smith that was adopted by his great great uncle Newton Smith and Newton Smith was a former slave and then he became a sharecropper and then he became a landowner and he had a farm uh, uh, thousands of acres uh, which was highly unusual and uh, he he and my aunt couldn't have great 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 aunt for me couldn't have kids so they adopted uh, uncle son Lee Arthur Smith and I was the only one that wanted to come from the city. We thought we lived in the city to go and hang out with my cousins and my older relatives up on uh, the farm, great uncle Newton Smith, great, great, great uncle Newton Smith farm. And one of the old guys, one of his relatives, one of his brothers lived way back up in the woods. He was very antisocial, Uncle Grady. And I told you before, uh, I went, I would hang out with Uncle Grady a lot back up in the hollers. And I went to the corner, one of the corner stores up in that area that was owned and operated, all of them were, uh, by a white guy. And Uncle Grady asked me to go in and ask for a can of Prince Albert II in the back of them. I asked for a can of Miss, I didn't ask for, that's what I asked for. The guy slapped me down, the white guy slapped me down. I was about eight years old and said, whenever you come up in here, you ask for a can of Mr. Prince Albert II in the back of I went back and told Uncle Grady about that. And he said, oh, yeah, boy, I forgot to tell you to say mister. And, you know, we kind of laughed about it a little bit and we stayed up there a few days. And I left a couple of weeks later. Uh, so I came back and I was back up there. And I heard that uh, uh, Uncle Grady had went up and had some words 
with the guy at the store. You know, a lot of white guys hung around at the store, mm -hmm. what they were doing. And so I was going back, walking back and forth between his house and the big house, uh, Uncle Son's house, back up, you know, going the little trails. And I came back one evening and we were sitting in, the, in his living room. He had a little shotgun house and we saw some white guys that pulled up in their trucks. It was a long walk from where the, where the dirt road was up to his little shack. And eight or nine white guys came out and they were headed toward the shack. And he said, boy, go out, and, go out in the back and hide somewhere. I don't know what's going to happen right here, but just go out in the back and don't, don't say nothing. And anyway, they came up and they they got him and they, they had some words and they I heard the words uppity nigga and I just moved back a little further in the woods and they began to beat on him and they tied him up, poured some gasoline on him and, and they hung him. And I stayed out there for a while and it, it got really dark. And when it got dark, I ran back over to the big house and I let them know what had happened. And my uncle, Uncle Son, went over there and then he came back and uh, Uh, he took me back. He took me back yeah, to the I'm city. Sure. He took me back to the city, and um, nothing, nothing ever came of it. Nothing ever came of it. Later on, yeah. I found out that some stuff happened as a result of it, but it never, it never made the news or anything like that. And mm -hmm. as I grew, I came to find out that you know stuff like that was was pretty normal back there at the age of seventeen. Uh, had a similar experience. I talked about this before. Uh, my 17-year-old classmate was dating a white girl, which we all encouraged him not to do that from another neighborhood. And some of the white boys caught him and drug him behind their pickup and tied him to a, a tree, an oak tree with some barbed wire. And he was naked and he was dead. And we went and saw him hanging on the tree. That made the news, but no one was ever arrested, you know, for that, his name was Lonnie Blaze. And these type of things would happen uh, periodically. And so I, uh, I also recall uh, going to City Hall one day. Uh, my father had bought an acre of land uh, on the Cooper Road where we lived. He was going to build his own home. So the first time I went downtown Streetport that I can re recall uh, must have been nine or 10 and we went into city hall. He had to go get the land registered and everything. And I distinctly remember down, looking down at the end of the hall that there was a noose hanging in the courthouse, in the hallway. And that's where they used to hang black people. Uh, they, the ones that weren't lucky enough to end up going to Angola. So all of these things were just etched in my mind and it made me get to the point where I just hated white people and, and uh, you know, I became the, uh, the president of the youth chapter of the NAACP and when Martin Luther King started the marches and everything, when we were about 17 or so, we would, uh, some of us uh, militant black youth, I remember having a set in at, at a Woolworths downtown at a lunch counter and we, we got arrested for that. And uh, I became a, a troublemaker in the neighborhood behind the, uh, the movement. So. Uh, my father ended up sending me to California. That's that's how I ended up coming out here. When I got yeah, out, safer, here, yeah, safer yeah. here in California, yeah, and and, and safe theoretically here. anyway. And, and safe, and safe me, for them. Let me let me just let me just ask you uh, here because uh, I just I wonder you were nine years old when you first saw this. I just I just wonder what the, the what your feelings were. I mean, were you scared? Were you angry? Were you shocked? Were you all of those together and all, you know all of all of those i was i was i was fearful but i was i was angry i was uh, seething with hate at the time uh, i think that was the overriding emotion as i began to look back over it more so than fear but the fear was certainly there and i was just dumbfounded why nobody was doing anything about it you know uh this is just the way it is uh uh, you just have to be careful and make sure that when you are, you know, when you stop, if you pulled over, when you get younger, you know, we, we go through this little ritual where they tell you how to act when you're around white people that are in mm -hmm. authority and, and, and the overriding thought in my mind is, is why is it like that? But no one would speak to that. I would talk to my teachers about 
you know, not about incidences, but about why is it like that? And they, they would just say things like, that's the way it is. Uh, yeah. I didn't believe that. So it just it made me have a big disdain uh, for white people. I thought it was the white people. It wasn't until later on till I started to self-educate. -edu and when I got out here and I started working with different races and I found out that it was more the system than it was the people. But there, you know, and that there were some good white people, there were some bad white people, there were some good black people, bad white people. I get, began to interact with, you know, with Jews and Muslims and uh, Orientals and Asian, just everybody. And it's just like to me, okay, the system is corrupt. And there are some corrupt people that come out of the system. Yeah, yeah. So and, and I, I know you you know you you said uh, that some of the things that you did you became you became a uh, basically a political mil a militant uh, the the lunch counter we I re yeah I remember those at the the, the lunch counters the people being pulled pulled by their hair and so forth to to, uh, to you know to to you know, to get them to get them away from get them away from the lunch counter. Were there any other kinds of things that you did? Uh, did you act out in any other ways? You don't need to get into any specifics. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking to have, uh, you know, the police come after you 40 years later. But yeah. just to say, you know, when you acted, when you when you were acting, I mean, the trouble that you said you were a troublemaker, but that's, I think, what John Lewis, I think it's his term, good trouble is, yeah. you know, sitting in the lunch counters and, and fighting for your rights. But did you do other stuff which maybe you're not, you know, you wish you didn't do or not so proud of? But again, we don't need any details. Yeah, well, I remember when uh, I was I was young, Martin Luther King uh, came to Shreveport and he spoke at a, at a church there in Shreveport. And uh, we were, uh, there was a group of us that were just always out and about. And we would see the George W. w. Dartors was, was the chief of police. And we would see the policemen going around busting the windshields out of all of the, the preachers, everybody that was at the uh, at the rally at the church when they came out, their windshields were, were knocked out, windows were knocked out. I saw the, I saw the policeman doing this type of thing. So, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a, a consequence of that, a lot of white windshields, like white people's windshields and things got, got knocked out, you know, in different places around the city. And, um, you know, a lot of the different little stuff like that, you know, and uh, we couldn't go to the movies. There were a couple of, two movie studios in town and we could only go to one and we could only go through the back door strand theater and we would have to go upstairs through the back well we were coming through the front and go down through the front and uh you know the security guards would would come and the the, the white kids that were at the movie we would be watching hercules or something like that would run after us and you know we would run out we were just defiant you can't go through the front door we went through the front door you can't you can't sit at the counter we sit at the counter you know, you can't be in this part of town unless you're uh, mowing the lawn or raking leaves or something like that. We would just walk through there. And of course, they would call the police and they would get after us. And, you know, we would run down through the trails and get away. But we were just being disrupted, rebelling the best way that we knew how. We didn't know anything about any political power or anything like that. We just we were just kids that didn't believe it, that, that we were less than. And and. So we did stuff like that and I started having run-ins and my father got fearful for my life. So I, I ended up in California. I wanted to ask you what your what 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 did your parents think of, of the kind of stuff you were doing? Were they comfortable with it? Or uh, I mean I know they if they shipped to California, obviously they weren't comfortable with it, but they, you know, did they support you? Let's put it like that. Well, they they were more intro introverted about it. My dad. Uh, my dad, my my grandfather was a sharecropper, and and my dad worked worked with him, and I I remember him telling the story, and I could hear his brothers and sisters telling the story that they would be out on the out chopping cotton, for instance. My dad was seventeen years old, and they would start chopping at six in the morning, and they would to chop from six in the morning to six in the evening. Well, nobody had had it; they didn't know what time it was, so they would just chop until it got dark because they didn't want to leave early, they didn't want to get in trouble you know, with the, with, with the white folks. So my dad uh, hustled up on enough money and bought a watch. And they began to, began to realize that every day at six o'clock, they would stop at six on the nose. And so the, the owner came up and said, well, how do you guys know how to stop? You're stopping at six o'clock. 
And so they said, Dan bought a watch. My dad's name was Dan. And so, uh, you know, that was a form of rebellion. Do you know how much money you costed me? They, sometimes they stay and work at seven or seven thirty. So it was, my dad was like that too, but he was just more quiet about it. And he and I would talk about it and he just said, boy, you can't do that. They, they're going to kill you. You can do little things, but you can't do stuff the way that you're doing it. And so that's, you know, so that's, that's the way I got out. But my dad ended up being a truck driver for Hummel Packing Company, he retired from there for 37 years. And best right. drive record in the history of the company, never had an accident, never, never missed a day's work, just a workaholic. And I All guess right. I'm still working today at the age of 72, I'm a workaholic too. But a lot of stuff happened from Miss Allen. I, uh, yeah. I, I came out here and got into this business, uh, floor covering business, which I still have, started making uh, what to us is a lot of money. Uh, got saved at the age of 42, moved back to Shreveport and uh, became a member of the Rotary Club back there, became a Paul Harris fellow back there. Uh, three white guys and a black friend and I, uh, uh, we, we uh, started the first public takeover charter school in northern Louisiana, uh, Linwood Public Charter School. It was a middle school. It's now from pre-K through the eighth grade. There's 1,004 students there now. So that's, that's still going on. Uh, my wife and I purchased a city block uh, in the black neighborhood. Uh, we bought an old bank building. We bought the first Brooks's that was Brooks's uh, supermarket that was ever built, was built in Shreveport, Louisiana. We bought that, that block. And we bought a, a, a Kentucky Fried Chicken building on the block. That old bank building now is a credit union in the black neighborhood that Brooks's has been divided up into a family dollar, uh, the church, uh, Best Beauty Supply, and the Kentucky Fried Chicken was initially the first church we moved over into the big building. It's now Bob and Beauty Shop. And then we bought a, a, a old skating rink, which is now a community uh, uh, building there where a nonprofit turning point community services where, you know, a lot of black kids go that so they won't be getting in trouble out there in the streets. So we just started doing stuff like that. And, you know, um, and here in Laguna Woods, after we retire, you know, we, we're affiliated now with, with you and our community uh, bridge builders and just come to learn that this racism has been around. It's not the race, it's the racism. And just talking to kids like Miss Nomers, uh, I'm black, right? That's what they say, I'm black, but my shirt is black. My beard is black. I'm not black, I'm brown. They say that you're white, your t-shirt is white, but your skin is not white. You're a different shade of brown. So it's, uh, uh, you know, black bark, black plague, you know, everything that's black is bad, everything that's white is pure and perfect. So you re-educate people about, about things like that. And, and you tell them that they're, uh, when, you know, we the people, where we weren't the people when they wrote the constitution, you know, things like that. Um, you just start talking, I'm not three fifths of a human being. And once yeah. you educate people and you start talking with people such as yourself, and we do opportunities, have opportunities like this, when you come to know the truth, you get educated. Yeah. You know, let me ask you something, something that you mentioned uh, in the, the early earlier part here. <laughs> so, excuse me, you said that you were saved. Uh, you were living in California, and you said you were saved. At least that's what I thought you said. Uh, now, I'm assuming that that is a uh, religious experience that you had. And uh, I'd be wondering if you'd be interested in talking about that, because I'd certainly be interested in hearing about it. My father raised What it means. My father it raised like, can yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, Lord. Yeah, go my ahead. father raised me up to be an atheist. My mother was a Baptist Christian. And so I uh, one evening, my wife and I were riding home, and I heard this preacher preaching on the radio. We just accidentally, I know not it was an accident, got on that revival, and he was just so prolific in what he was preaching. And it just it just took me by surprise. And I just pulled over to the curb in, in, in Los Angeles. And he said, Well, the broadcast is over. If you want to come to, you can, if you're in the neighborhood, come by Apostolic Faith Home Assembly Church and, and, and uh, we're going to be here for another hour or so. When I looked up, we were blocking the driveway to the church on Adams Boulevard. I backed up out of the driveway, we went in and my wife and I both got baptized that night. 
Um, I got ordained a uh, year and a half later and we moved back to Shreveport to get my father saved. That's why I originally came back. And we ended up staying there for 17 years. We started a church, four churches grew out of that church. So there were five churches that we planted and of the five, four are still, still uh, in operation. The pastor, one of them died. And that was the beginning of the new me, really, once I got saved, once I, I realized that, you know, we are all human beings and we're here to help disciple other people and that love, you know, conquers hate and that right uh, conquers evil in the long run. And so that's, that, was a turn, that was a turning point for me once I became a believer. Wow. And do you think, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'm curious if you think, say you, uh, you said your father raised you to be an atheist. If you continued as an atheist or you were an agnostic, do you think this, um, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to call it, not a, not a reformation of, of you, just a change. Let's just be basic and say the change in your, your attitude, the change in the way you perceive things and do things. Do you think that could have happened without, uh, without call it religious intervention or, you know, or, or being saved? A part of a transformation that started just by associating with, uh, you know, I'm not a, not a, I'm, I'm not an ignorant person. So just through my associations, uh, through my work with different races, uh, I got, I gained a lot of knowledge about uh, this human nature. And, and I had blinders on when I was in Louisiana. It was just a black and white world. When I came out here and I began to interact, I knew that that was different. But the, no, the change really wouldn't have happened if I hadn't come to know the Lord as my savior, because not only did I get information, I got revelation and through the revelation, then I want to reach across the table to people such as yourself to find out what we all have in common and to work on the good for it. We're always gonna have differences, but there are some things that we have in common. And the, to me, the common denominator is that we are all human beings. And we can all get along. And it starts by having talks like this. One of the things that I've learned is that we didn't create the, the we didn't create the, the situations that we're in. A lot of so-called white people are gonna have to, they have the power. They are the system, it's their system, and we are part of their system. They have to want to interact with us. We can't change anything. We can be a part of the change, but ultimately the change is on your side of the table. And so we have to reach your heart. God has to reach your heart. And, and then you have to effect some changes so that this thing be, can become real to us. If we had the power to change it, we would. You, the system has the power to change, but nobody wants to change the system because it's, it's economic capitalism is king, you know, and, and, and to have uh, layers of, of uh, tiers of, of subservitude and everything, it's a lot of money in that. I, I learned a lot from the Rotary Club. And so it's a big financial thing. They don't want to do it. Poverty for me is richness for the next person. But yeah. it can happen. <laughs> it's happening slowly, but we can't do it. Yeah. All of us together have to do it. It has to be led by the so-called white people because it's their system. It's not to, it's, it strikes me what, what you're saying, and I, I agree with you. I don't know if this is what you're saying, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's, not, it's not a question. You can pass all the laws that you want to pass. And yes, they serve a purpose. They certainly serve a purpose. But in reality, it's, as they say, quote, hearts and minds. It's speaking to people, changing their hearts and minds and making them realize who we, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing to me. <laughs> Excuse me, but we, uh, you know, we all have our prejudices. We all feel a certain way. We're all more comfortable with people who are like us. But most of us, when we meet with a person one on one, we're not thinking about all that. You know, I, you know, meeting with you, I don't care that you're not a white man or you're a black man or a person of color. It doesn't make any difference. It's me and you. Uh, yeah. And I think that's, you know, once we get to that point, I mean, I, that, that's the way I look at it. And I, 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 I just wonder if you agree with that, that it's really hearts and minds, not, not laws and government. 
Well, you, you, you can't legislate love. Love has to come from the heart. You can't, you can't order me to love you and you can't order anyone to love anyone else. It has to come from, from the heart. And you can't love what you don't know. You can't love who you don't know, uh, not intimately. And I'm, and I'm talk, not talking about eros. I'm talking about like agape, a phileo. You have to interact with people and you start loving them because you first learn that love is the, the common denominator that changes everything and it can't be legislated. Well, that's a great place to stop on. <laughs> We're out of time. I, I really want to, I want to thank you so much uh, for, for speaking and obviously speaking from my heart. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, I, I, I'll tell I'll tell you if, just before we go off because I, I had mentioned this. We you know we we started talking about this uh, you know a while back. We only had a couple of conversations, but and I mentioned to to some people who are people of color that uh, you know we're going to do this, and I said, well, you know, this is an experience that nobody else has had, and all the people that have said to me, yeah, you think so? <laughs> so, you know, you think nobody's had this experience? So it was, you know, it was an education to me. It's always an education. You're you're absolutely right. Learn, live and learn, talk and learn, feel and learn. Uh, uh, it's, 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 this is not unique to me, Alan. This happened a lot where I came from. My, my little story is just a little story. Uh, yeah. it, it, it Wholesale, it happened all over. You know? Yeah, yeah. And we got to go. I'm sorry, Willie, we're running out of time. Thank Really, thank you so much. Uh, you're very eloquent in describing what happened and uh, uh, very eloquent in describing your journey. And, uh, you know, we live here in Laguna Woods. We're lucky to have you here in Laguna Woods, truly, yeah, you know, person of quality. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we will uh, see you with Black in Laguna Woods uh, next time, in next month or so. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Alan. Thanks for having me. Thank